Okay, so first let me start by thanking Abhishek and Sanjeev for firstly for organizing this very useful series of schools and uh, secondly for asking me to come here and talk to you and uh, thirdly for assigning me this topic. You know I have worked on sand pile problems for a while some 20 years and I worked on directed percolation some 35 years ago. <coughs> then we wrote some papers on these topics connecting them also. So the last paper I wrote on this topic was around 2002 where we showed some connection between these two problems. Then there was a lot of controversy in literature whether what we had argued in our paper was true or not. So, some part of it was actually shown established, some part of it was conjectured on the basis of the numerical simulations and stuff. Then other people did better simulations and they sort of felt that those conclusions were not well drawn. Then Mohanty in 2012 did some more simulations where they saw that no, 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 it looks like the previous analysis of data was not very well done and there are interesting new effects which come in uh, which make the previous conclusions questionable. So, anyway there is a some amount of controversy on this topic and I was uh, staying away from it roughly, I was not paying enough attention. But once I was told to speak on this topic then I had to worry about it you know, so I started looking up this stuff. Then I got interested, then we actually started some recent work with Grassberger and Mohanty again on this problem and I might get there. I will try to tell you uh, some new things we can understand actually using fairly elementary methods, but some of the work is still in progress and uh, you know, so some of the conclusions one mm, guesses are going to be tentative, but we will get there. So, let me start by uh, not assuming that you know about sand pile models and directed percolation. So, let me give you some history about uh, sand pile models and more generally about self organized criticality, which is the broader topic. Okay, so So, well, so firstly, so there, there is a word called fractals which I am supposing most of you are familiar with. How many of you are familiar with the word fractals? Everybody is familiar. So, very good. So, there is a very nice book by Mendelbrot where he has shown that lot of natural forms are not very well described in terms of classical geometrical shapes like spheres and cubes and irregular shapes we often encounter in nature like mountain landscapes or soap powder or river networks are better described in term coastlines are better described in terms of fractals. Okay. So, well let us take some examples. So, mountain landscape so you take some surface of earth at each point there is a mean sea level and there is a height above the mean sea level h of x you can define. Then of course, h of x is some complicated function which gives you the profile, which has to be imagined two dimensional profile x is a two dimensional variable gives you the x and y long longitude and latitude of the point. Then how do I describe this kind of function? Okay. So, one way to think about it 
is to describe it in statistical terms instead of giving the precise positions of some particular mountain range you describe the general behavior in terms of a function which we will see it is a useful function to discuss is the just here. So, if you take two different positions x and y and you try to calculate the height difference between these then it is if you pick points at random it is likely to be positive or negative. So, let us take the square of it then keep the distance between x and y fixed and average over possible values of the midpoint. Then you will get some average over a mountain range which is a number and then I vary the distance and see how the mean square distance difference in heights the variance of the height difference varies with distance between points. So, it is clear to me that of course, if x is equal to y this is 0 and it is an increasing function of r the separation. Okay. And uh, so, one possible function which describes this behavior is um, a power law. This function cannot grow too fast, because I suppose the mountain ranges have to have a maximum slope which is finite. So, it says that this alpha has to be between 0 and 2. 2 is the case of linear profile, which is sort of the upper. Okay. So, then people can go into various um, actual field data and measure the value of alpha in experiments from, in, from real data. And then you find that the value of alpha is um, can anybody guess how much it is going to be like because all of you have seen mountains. So, r is the distance between x and y. Yes. Yes. Yes, very good. Less than one. Yeah, it's around point three, point four, like that. And roughly speaking, it is constant for different mountain ranges. Okay, you can go to European mountains, American mountains, Indian mountains. The value of alpha is roughly the same. Which we say otherwise. We say that when you see a mountain range, you recognize it as a mountain range. Okay. And then people have constructed artificial mountain ranges in Hollywood, when they want to go to a, some funny extraterrestrial planets and they consider uh, lands, mountainscape over there, they pick a value of alpha, which is not the one which is encountered in nature. Then you see, when you look at that landscape picture, which uh, easily downloaded from the internet, you can recognize these are not earth like mountains, they are some funny stuff. Okay. So, the important point I am trying to emphasize is there is a value of alpha which characterizes mountains and can we determine this value of alpha from basic principles, because it does not depend on the details of the geography involved you know strength of rocks which make the mountain range and stuff like that. Okay. Um, Okay, so, that is one question. Uh, let us take river networks. So, in river networks what people have found is that you have lots of uh, big river basins with lots of rivers which flow into each other and merge and in delta regions they break apart in, into big regions. Then, um, a very interesting systematics have been observed in real river networks. One of which, which is so, I, you know, I'm, I'm, this is only sort of side issue for me, so I will not give the full stuff. But you take a river network, which usually consists of lots of rivers joining each other like that. Then you sit at one point and you 
So, what happens in reverse is that there is a lot of rain which falls from above and all of it has to drain into the sea in the end let us say evaporation let us ignore for the moment. Then uh, there are small rivulets which flow out and they join to form bigger rivulets and then rivers and then bigger rivers and so you get a river network it is also called a drainage network. Okay. So, you sit at one point and you say the water flowing out of here where did it come from where the, it came as rain, but where did it come from. So, that is called the catchment basin all the water which was here is flowing out here. Okay. So, there is an area of the catchment basin and then you stay here and you say if I went up the river how far up could I go what is the longest upstream I can go just going along water. Okay. And so, it was observed that this is called length of longest upstream river. goes as area to the power beta. So, if I am sitting here you know I can go upstream like this then I stop here, but if I go here then I go further and if you go here I go even further. So, I just pick the longest uh, stream I can go up in okay. and then I am asking what is the length of the longest upstream as a function of area, how does it change with area. Suppose I come here then the area will increase the length will also increase how do they change. So, the answer is one of these is length the other is area you would naively guess that beta is 1 by 2 right. Unfortunately, a uh, lot of field observation has shown that beta is not half beta is closer to 0 0.62 let us say some such number. So, where does this number come from again this number is pretty robust it is the same you find in different geographical regions and so can we understand where this number comes from and uh, uh, you know what is the uh, theory is there a theoretical explanation for this number. Okay. Um, let us take some other examples. Um, earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes, uh, well, they occur because of these continental plates are moving and they collide against each other. When they are coming towards each other, it builds up stress. When the stress becomes too big, then some crack occurs locally and uh, you know that causes earthquake. Okay. So, people have measured the frequency of earthquakes it is called Gutenberg Richter law and what he said was that if you plot the magnitude of earthquake against the log of the frequency sorry it is the wrong way log of frequency of earthquake versus the magnitude you get a straight line. So, magnitude of earthquake is measured in this Richter scale it is 7, 8, 9 whatever it is a logarithmic scale you have to estimate the energy released in the earthquake and if the magnitude is one more like magnitude 8 earthquake has 10 times as much energy released as magnitude 7 earthquake. So, the magnitude is the log of the energy released and this is the log of the frequency of earthquakes how often do the earthquakes occur and it is observed that this is roughly linear. Okay. So, the there is a power law relationship between the frequency of earthquakes and the magnitude bigger earthquakes of course, occur less often and can we understand why that happens 
Okay. This is actually a very well observed law. It is observed over roughly 8 mag orders of magnitude from magnitude 0 to magnitude 8 earthquakes. 8 is more or less the largest earthquake magnitude for which there is a reasonable amount of data available. Okay. So, over a range of 10 to the power 8, <laughs> is the bottom of this board visible to everybody? Uh, the cutoff occurs where? Here? Further down? This, this is visible? I will not go below this. Okay. Okay. So, can we understand this law? Then a similar thing has been observed more recently about more sort of interesting phenomena like rain. So, of course, you know you get reports about rain uh, every day in newspaper, but people have done much more sophisticated experiments. We, uh, the newspaper reports about rain are usually over a biggest geographical region. They say in northern Maharashtra there will be some scattered rain at various places. Okay. But what you can do is you can take a um, instrument which is let us say uh, the instrument they use is something like two parallel capacitor plates which are of size 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. Okay. Such that if any rain comes in here, any raindrop it goes down, but then you know the capacitor changes and there is a record made of the rain event. Okay. And this record can be made every millisecond. So, you have a data at one point more or less instead of a big region, but over a scale of milliseconds for several years and you can see how much rain occurs per millisecond that is the intensity of rain. And then you can plot the same function how often does intensity. So, you know sometimes there is no rain of course, that is most of the time. So, those events you ignore when there is at least one event there is at least one raindrop of measurable size which goes through then you start counting and then you plot the log of frequency versus magnitude and you get a similar power law over 5 decades of intensity. So, which is quite big and it is worth understanding where that occurs. Okay. Um, there are other examples of such fractal forms in nature, but I will not give all of them now. Okay. It is the same log of frequency of event versus the magnitude of event. How often do um, events of this size bigger than this occur? Yeah, you, you log of the intensity. Right. It is very impressive data. I mean, for a long time, all the meteorological data available was roughly daily basis you know they would have a rain meter and they will measure the rain occurring per day, which does not give you adequate resolution. But it turns out that if you can observe rain at this kind of um, resolution, you find that the power law holds over 5 decades of intensity, uh, which I would not have guessed a priori. Okay. All right. So, now, uh, so, so, what are these fractal forms in the end? What they show is that there are all these events which occur and they show so, they show long range correlations in space and time. Okay. Over the um, mountain ranges, 
they are size 1000 kilometers and uh, over this range the heights are correlated in some way. So, where do these correlations come from or is the same thing for rain events you know you can have rain events which are. So, correlation in rain events uh, you know like it is raining right now then what is the probability that it will keep on raining for one more hour pretty high. Okay. But if you actually measure the correlation they continue for months like it is raining now then after one month also it is more likely to be raining than not. Is that point clear to everybody? This is very obvious you know because there is a four month period in which rain occurs and the rest of the period is kind of dry. Okay, in some parts of the world it is more than one season of rain, but you know roughly speaking. I come from North India, there the rain is only once in one year. Uh, okay, one period there is a rainy season, here there are two rainy seasons. Okay, um, so, where do these correlations come from? Can we understand them? Okay, so, that was our starting aim. So, you would like to develop models where these kinds of observations come as outputs and not as inputs. Okay. Now, a priori observe, so existence of these correlations which have this very long range is not very obvious, especially to people who are trained in statistical physics because in statistical physics we have been studying um, critical phenomena for a very long time like liquid gas uh, or some such thing. And there one learns that you know if you take some typical fluid with the, some pressure and temperature then the correlations between the positions or velocities of particles uh, decay in space exponentially fast. Okay, uh, except at the critical point. So, almost all the time the correlations decay exponentially fast, the range of correlations is of the size of the typical interatomic spacing. Okay. So, it is very hard to get correlations at the distance of 1 meter for atomic systems, okay. but in the end these are all systems made up of atoms. So, if we are going to describe these kinds of systems, I have to understand how the correlations of very long range can occur in a statistical physical system. So, I realize that these are of course, non equilibrium systems. Um, so, I will not be able to use the formalism of equilibrium statistical mechanics to be able to describe these correlations, no Boltzmann weight factors to describe. Okay. But uh, um, we are still simplifying a little bit because non equilibrium is too big a field. So, these are steady states. So, I imagine that okay, this is a weather system or whatever, but one year the system looks more or less statistically the same as the next year. Okay. So, the system is in some kind of steady state, of course, we are going to see fluctuations within the steady state, but it is in a steady state. Okay. If you are not in the steady state, then you have even more complicated evolutions possible, which we are not discussing just now. Okay. What else? Um, most of the time this stuff is non-linear, uh, you know because there is a well developed theory of linear response or some such thing and all these systems are non-linear and all that kind of linear response theory will not get you very far. Um, and then there is just one more word. dissipated. So, in all these systems the fact that um, actually there is one more word 
they come together in some sense. Open systems means the energy can come in and energy can go out and dissipative says that there is actually a loss of energy within the system. On, because the energy is coming, coming in, because of dissipation a steady state is possible otherwise you will not get a steady state. Okay? But uh, you know all these things put together make the task of a theoretical physicist substantially hard because any one of these by itself causes us nightmares you know like equilibrium things are much better understood than non equilibrium and linear things are much better understood than non linear and non dissipative systems are better understood than dissipative and so on. Okay? So, how do we um, understand them? Uh, so, this was uh, the question and the first important realization was that actually these objects occur all the time. So, I briefly alluded to it, but let us write it. In conventional critical phenomena, in order to see long range correlations, you have to fine tune the temperature to be within a micro degree of the critical value, otherwise you do not see very, the correlations do not extend very far. Okay? But in natural systems like mountains, the temperature keeps on varying day and night and okay, over centuries it can vary by much more and uh, it has seen all this stuff over thousands of years and nothing is held constant, temperature is not constant, energy is coming in, energy is going out and there is a still a steady state. Okay? So, the existence of these long range correlations is not dependent on very fine tuning of some temperature or strength of rock or some such thing. Okay? So, it was uh, argued by Pear back in 87. Pierbach, Tang and Wiesenfeld. Um, I suppose I should just write Bach because um, if I try to write the full name of everybody, that will take the whole line. Wiesenfeld. Um, that these systems self organize to be at critical point. Okay. So, there is no external agency, they are these systems just by their own natural dynamics organize themselves to be such that they show long range correlations. Okay. So, there has been a lot of discussion about this, so let me just mention it a little bit. The word self organization is actually older vintage, it is around 1970, Haken, etc. Haken, Prigojin and co workers had discussed the idea of self organization and they were discussing life and they were asking how is it that all these funny chemical molecules get together in this some special way to form a living cell. Okay? Because it is very hard to imagine from simple entropy arguments that all these molecules will get together to form a reproducing or a living cell. Okay? And so, they said we do not understand this very well, but let us give it at least a name. And they said that this happens by itself, the molecules do not do much thinking. However, they are able to organize themselves into this macroscopic coherent structures whatever they are, which for example, can um, move around and um, you know do various things. Okay? So, that was the idea of self organization. The idea of criticality here is exactly these long range correlations that stuff came from physics of critical phenomena where you say that a system is critical if it shows power law correlations over space and time. If it shows exponentially decaying correlations that is not called critical. 
ok. Ok, so very good, so that was the notion of self-organized criticality and they said can we find models we show all these features non equilibrium blah 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 and they do not have fine tuning to get to critical points, but they show critical behavior. Okay. So, uh, what are good cases where we can do this? Ok, so this is um, sand piles. Is paradigm ok. So, I could um, start with that, but maybe um, maybe uh, before I get there I should just uh, still uh, say that whatever I said so far seems rather clear and unobjectionable to most people I, I guess. You know the fact all I said was that there are fractals in nature and we want to understand them. Why do mountains have this particular you know long range correlations or why do rain have this long range correlations and the fact that these phenomena are there and there are many more examples which I did not mention are not to be disputed. However, recently there have been lots of review articles on self organized criticality where people have argued um, that you know there are self organized criticality is seen in papers in physical review, but is it seen in nature. Okay. Now, I am trying to just say that this is obviously untrue, but you know these people are sort of learned people respectable people and what they are saying is they are in some ways uh, garbling the question. So, what they say is that ok yeah they, there is um, there is a model of sand piles called the sand pile model, but that is not seen in nature. There is no natural system which behaves just like the sand pile that Peerbach defined that may be so let us accept that that is true, but that does not say that self organized criticality does not occur in nature it only occurs in pages in physical review. The models we discuss are going to be approximate they will not describe the full physical phenomena in great detail that is not to say that the phenomena does not exist and a better model cannot be defined. Okay. A second objection is of the type they say that oh yeah there is some self organized criticality some power law is seen, but it is only seen in, in, in a limited range of variables like ok. So, you have mountains you have correlations, but they are only at length scale from 10 centimeter to 1000 kilometers what happens at 10000 kilometers it is not seen the earth is round very nice and round sphere right. So, in any particular problem there will be upper and lower cutoffs, which are dependent on the details of the problem one can worry about those cutoffs, but the fact that they are cutoffs there does not undermine the question that you know there is a wide range of scales over which the correlations are there they are approximate power laws if they are not exact power laws I do not care. I would still say that there is a long range correlation and that will be enough 
for me to say there is some criticality and ok I mean I was not ordering that this peak should occur there that peak should occur there in the mountain range. So, to that degree they are self organized ok. Um, so, I am trying to um, say that for me the self organized criticality occurs in nature is more or less a given truth. The making nice models where it is seen is more complicated one may succeed one may not succeed, but one should not confuse the two questions. If it turns out that a particular model I describe tomorrow does not work very well you just go home and make another mod, another better description of the world around you ok. It does not say that the reality out there cannot be described and whatever way you describe it we will call it self organized criticality that is for me the working definition of a subject ok. So, then I can go back to this stuff. So, Pierbach actually um, described a very simple model to illustrate this idea of self organized criticality. So, that has to do with granular media which are of course, every um, child knows how to play with sand. So, it is a very um, easy to explain example. So, what happens in sand is that if you take, so we work with dry sand. Uh, you can also work with wet sand it is very interesting for making castles so and stuff sorry, but um, no more complicated. So, let us work with dry sand if you take dry sand and you just pour it from some nozzle onto a flat table then you form a pile. The pile is roughly in the shape of a cone and um, this angle of the cone which the sides of the surface make with the horizontal is called the critical slope is called the um, angle of repose. So, for a given um, kind of sand there is a angle of repose. If you change the sand you know make bigger grains or something take the sand from Ganga delta versus that take the sand from um, seaside or some such thing. There are tiny small variations in this angle, but it is around 40 degrees or some such thing ok. It does not vary so much ok. So, that Mm, so, for any particular material let us fix the kind of sand we are dealing with. So, you take one mm, particular type of sand then whether you make a small pile or a big pile you get the same angle of repose and this is ro roughly understood from the times of Coulomb. He sort of said that you know if you mm, the angle of repose is related to the coefficient of friction if you make this angle too big then grains will slide off that is the uh, very qu quick qualitative explanation, but anyway there is some angle. So, the property of this angle of repose is that if you make a pile which is lower than the angle of um, repose uh, slope, then this pile is stable and uh, if you drop a little bit of sand on it then it just stays there. If you perturb the pile by a little bit of perturbation by adding a few more grains they do not do much they just go and sit there ok. However, if you make a pile which is like this which has an angle which is bigger than the angle of repose then one can actually make this pile because you just tap them well and you can form a pile which is there. But if you perturb it a little bit the whole thing drops down there is a big avalanche and the angle goes down to the angle of repose and then it remains there ok. So, there is a sort of this is called stable this is called unstable and there is a this is for theta less than theta c this is for theta greater than theta c 
and there is a threshold of instability between these two which is called theta c which is the angle of repose. Okay. And the remarkable point about this system is that you just send, drop sand from top and the cone is formed with the angle equal to the angle of repose. Okay. So, the system is organizing itself to be at the edge of stability it is called. Okay. So, that is the it is organizing itself to be at the transition from stable to unstable states. So, that was his example which is um, not so tough to understand because you see what happens is that if you start with this pile and you add slowly then um, the grains just add if um, the angle rises until the angle of repose, but it cannot rise beyond the angle of repose and then there is an instability threshold it um, decreases. Okay. So, the basic mechanism of self organization is rather easy to see in this simple example. Okay. Then um, yeah, also there is no need to fine tune anything here, you can take grains which have slightly different shape, you can take rice, drop it from top it will also form a pile, you take wheat it will also form a pile, slightly different angles but they will all form they will organize themselves to be at their critical angle of repose. Okay. So, the absence of fine tuning is understood um, so um, Perbach argued that similar phenomena occurs in things like earthquakes. So, what happens is that the, um, there is some biggish system with lots of stress at various places, but the stress keeps on rising because of the movement of plates, but uh, eventually at some stage it cannot rise beyond the value. So, there is a local threshold at which there is some failure occurs which is called some relaxation and once the relaxation occurs the stress is redistributed to neighbors which may then cause those Mm, mm, rocks to mm, exceed their threshold of stability and you know fail and that is why a big crack forms and develops. The phenomena here is like you drop some sand then it can uh, this particular grain can make the other sand particles which it touches unstable and so these two particles will then go out below and then the avalanche grows and it can become bigger or it can stop. Okay. So, very good. Um, so, I think this comment about fine tuning to 0 I can defer to later. Okay, so, after this um, so, Pierbach actually discussed a specific model of sand piles. Uh, I will describe it only sketchily because I am not going to deal with it in great detail, but he said that let us take a square lattice. let us define some integers um, at each site which is the number of grains at that site. So, at each square there is uh, some number of grains and there is a maximum number of grains which can stay at one site. So, if there are more than 4 grains then the site becomes unstable. So, he said that if z is greater than z c then some local instability occurs and there is a toppling and the particles from here will um, leave. So, he said the simplest case is when one particle is dropped to each of the neighbors and then maybe this height was previously 3, but now it has become 4, 4 is unstable even that will topple 
and uh, you know so this thing can grow, but eventually some particles from here uh, leave the system if a toppling occurs and then you keep on adding particles they keep on leaving the system there is a long time steady state of the system. Okay. Now, this is a um, non equilibrium steady state of a dissipative open system that much is there. It has a property that it has um, so it has the property steady drive and uh, burst like irregular uh, relaxation. So, what happens uh, let us not get into the details, but you take some pile like this you keep on adding one grain at a time and let the um, relaxation event occur and then you add one more grain and then so on and then you monitor the outflux as a function of time and the events kind of look like this I am drawing it schematically here. Sometimes nothing happens you know if I am only watching what is leaving the system. So, sometimes you know you keep on adding nothing happens then all of a sudden very large number of grains will suddenly leave then a small number will leave and while I add grains at a constant rate 1 the rate at which things leave the system is highly um, irregular and has lots of sometimes only 2 grain will leave sometimes 2000 will leave lot of magnitude of events can be very big. That was another part which we wanted to understand the relaxation occurs in events of a very wide range of sizes. Okay. And um, so, you can change the rules of the dynamics by making all kinds of variations you like do not work on the square lattice, work on the cubic lattice, work on the triangular lattice or something irregular lattice and whatever all these phenomena does not depend on all those details at this level I am discussing and it is robust in this sense. If you look in great detail at the power law which describes the sizes of events then maybe I will have some problems maybe they are not always the same maybe they depend on the details of the lattice or some such thing details of the dynamics that is what we would like to understand. But at least this level of detail they are working. Okay. So, since that time uh, people like this general idea and it is obviously very appealing a priori it does not require a lot of work to construct variations of this model uh, and people constructed lot of these models and they studied them in great detail for the next several years. And then um, some 1920 of such models were defined with various names like there is the BTW Bakhtang Wiesenfeld model, there is the Mana model, there is the Zhang model, there is the um, Oslo model, there is um, many other names let us not get into just name calling business A, B, C, D model, C, D, E, F model and various generalizations. Okay. So, then the question became that okay, so you can define all these models they can show this overall feature then what have we learned from it right. Uh, so, that is a very um, good question and uh, the answers are not fully understood even now. So, there is a very wide class of sand pile models and sand pile like models or different other models of self organized criticality we can define. It is a theoretical question 
to say what happens in these models. So, that you can try to study either theoretically or by computer simulations. Then you can modify these models to make them closer to real life. Like I want to describe a model of solar flares. How does that happen? You know, solar flares are also events like this. As a function of time, there is some event which occurs in various sizes. Can we describe them? So, there is some model or the other, but then somebody is not very happy with that model and they want to make a different model. So, we, these are all legitimate activities and one can continue to do them. Uh, unfortunately, for most of the natural phenomena like rain which I discussed, these descriptions are at very elementary stage. Because if you want to describe something like rain, you have to worry about convection you know the clouds carry rain from one place to another that is what monsoon is about. And convection is a complicated turbulent problem and as soon as you utter the word turbulence a lot of people can only think of Kolmogorov and nothing beyond. And Kolmogorov does not have too much to say about patterns of convection which are important for you know this is not fully developed turbulence this is just turbulence. Okay, the fact that it is not fully developed and there is a spatial structure in the turbulence is very important. So, I cannot naively use Kolmogorov theory to tell what happens to the monsoon next year. So, those kinds of problems are very tough to discuss where they will not they have the only attempts I know to do them have been very preliminary and very unsuccessful. Okay, but that is just to emphasize the fact that you know that is our lack of understanding as opposed to the problem not being there or the problem not being interesting a priori. Okay, so, now that was sort of description of self organized criticality and now I want to describe directed percolation and then maybe um, get the connection between them in some way. Okay, so, erase this stuff. So, directed percolation is a problem with very long and illustrious history. It started with Hammersley in um, around 1955 and he was describing um, spread of disease in apple orchards. So, what he said was well you know you can model an apple orchard certainly by um, lot of trees planted in regular array like that. So, that is my orchard. Then he noticed that if you plant the trees very close to each other, then if one of the trees gets infected, the infection spreads very easily to all the other trees. But if you keep the spacing slightly bigger, then this phenomena can be avoided to good degree. And it is interesting to ask what is the optimal size of the spacing between such uh, trees. I want to maximize the my yield you know, per year by planting as many trees as possible, but I want to avoid the problem of too much infection occurring and all that kinds of problems. Okay, so, that was the original motivation, but he said that you know, so I can think of the trees as working on a square lattice. Then, if there is one site which has an infected tree, then this infection can spread to a neighbor with a probability p, probability of 
infecting a neighbor. Okay, we will take the simple model that an infected tree remains infected and now the neighbor can catch infection or it may be it is an immune it would not catch infection. Okay. So, then uh, this p is a function of the spacing um, lambda, but there is a value of p below which the infection spreads to arbitrarily large distance and above p it does not spread. That was the original problem he started with then he realized that actually the infection spreads in time, but I do not have to worry about them. So, he converted the problem. So, infection problem which is sort of development of infection in time to a static problem. in which you do not mention time at all. You just say that okay, here is a tree that is infected. Now, I look at its neighbor. This is possible to be infected with probability p and be immune with probability 1 minus p. So, I assign it some value i or infected or immune, healthy or infected, healthy is h. I will draw them without and the infected ones are big circles. This one maybe it is infected, this one is not infected, this one. So, you go to any site the, which has a neighbor which is infected, then you infect it with probability p or mark it as not infectable with some probability and then you ask what happens to this problem and this is the standard percolation problem, it is called site percolation in this case. That was the origin of the percolation problem. How many of you have heard of the percolation problem before? Lot. Okay. So, so, now I can state the problem as stated in usual textbooks. So, they say take a lattice at each site you independently occupy a site with probability p or not occupy with probability 1 minus p. So, for a given um, stuff there is a configuration with zeros and ones. Um, for each configuration you can write a probability, then you can ask what is the probability that there is an infinite cluster of um, neighboring sites which are all infected. Okay. And the answer is that this probability of an infinite cluster. Uh, let me see, let us be precise infinite cluster. So, what I will calculate instead is that I will pick a site, I will say what is the probability that this belongs to a cluster which has an infinite number of other con infected sites. And so, this answer turns out to be some function like that, it is 0 exactly up to a value called p c and non 0 above and then lot of people study this particular percolation problem. Uh, how does this probability increase, what is the value of p c and that kind of stuff and that depends on the lattice. Yes. So, what exactly do you mean by infinite cluster? So, infinite line is a string? Uh, yeah. So, infinite actually means suppose you work on a system of size l, then if you can let. So, the percolation problem has this very nice pro property, which is that suppose I look at a local neighborhood. So, I look at this site. I say what is the probability that it, it forms a cluster of size 1 namely that none of its neighbors are infected. This probability is just that q to the power 4 times the p is the probability that this site was infected. So, probability of cluster of size 4 sorry cluster of size 1 is p q to the power 4 and this does not depend on what happens outside. So, I can take a bigger cluster now and this answer does not change. However, if I take a probability of a bigger size cluster that will also have an answer, but of course, a cluster of size 2 uh, will not occur on the smaller scale. 
So, all these problems have very nice limits of infinite L. Uh, so, sorry. The, so, I can ask what is the probability of cluster of size 50. Okay. Then for very small neighborhoods, there will be no cluster of size 50, but for all L bigger than some particular value, this number will stabilize to a number, it will not depend on the size of L at all. Okay. So, these limits are very nice and well defined and that is why mathematicians like this problem more. So, so you can define probability of cluster of size S <coughs> and then you can say what is the probability that this site is connected to more than 100 sites or more than 1000 sites that also tends to a finite limit for L goes to infinity. Okay. And uh, in particular, if first you let L go to infinity, then it actually is connected to infinite number of sites because there is a path to infinity which goes. This is uh, okay. So, for the percolation problem, there are lots of very nice results which are known. Uh, I will not discuss them, that is a different course, but the key result which is used in all these proofs of various results is a very simple property. In percolation problems, what one is usually interested in is the question that suppose you take one site here and one site here, is there a path of connected sites which are all present which goes from A to B? That is a typical question you ask. Okay. So, the important result is the following that if I have an event like this path from A is connected. Then, if I somewhere else I add one more link, sorry, one more site, make, make it infected, then this probability can only increase. Okay. While this result sounds very simple, it says that okay, if I calculate the probability of connection from here to here, then I make this lattice bigger, then this probability can only increase. Okay. So, this monotonicity of probability which is rather elementary just now is a very important result which allows you to prove very large number of results in a rather simple and obvious way. Okay. Um, and that is what uh, we shall use in future. Okay, so, let me let us be more careful with this. So, let me take a system of size L by L, it can be in higher dimensions, but let us work in two dimensions. Then there is a probability called spanning probability. Spanning probability is the probability that there is a path from bottom to top. Okay. Probability that there is a path. Uh, from bottom to top. So, this probability uh, let us call the spanning probability as a function of the, the p is the parameter this is the site percolation probability and as a function of p this quantity varies I guess p varies from 0 to 1 s of p also varies from 0 to 1. is also a probability. At 0, the answer is 0, at 1, the answer is 1. In between, it is a monotonic increasing function of p with a little bit of, um, so I can take L equal to 5 and I can ask what happens and the answer is like this. It is the spanning probability, the probability that there is a path from bottom to top of connected sites and that is a monotonic increasing function of p. Here, the you know if you want to have a path, you have to have this some site here, some site here. So, it goes like p to the power l and it is very small if p is small. So, here the answer is very close to 0, but it is always non-zero. Even at p equal to 0 0.0007, there is a finite probability that there will be a connection to the top. Okay. However, if I now increase L, then this function in changes 
and it changes like this. Small p it decreases. For large p it increases. <coughs> There is no time, this is the percolation problem. So, this is the time independent formulation. You just have sets of sites, they have some probabilities, and you ask what is the probability of a path from A to B, from bottom to top. Uh, time we will like to introduce, but I will hold it till later. Okay. So, then if you let L go to infinity, it turns out that this graph s of p tends to this graph 0 1. For p less than p c the probability that you will have a path from bottom to top goes to 0, for p bigger than p c the probability goes to 1. Okay. And in between there is a of course, for any finite l this is a smooth graph, but it tends to the mm, limit graph which is like that. So, that is the percolation problem people would like to understand well and there is a lot of work uh, which uh, I am not discussing. Okay. Okay. So, now why is this called directed percolation? So, we have understood what is percolation problem. Okay. So, percolation problem for me let us reformulate it. is called Bernoulli percolation. Okay, so, it says there is a lattice, for our case it is an L by L square lattice, but you can think of others. Each side is independently occupied with probability p and uh, empty with one minus Okay. Then I say that so I take a configuration. Uh, there is some side A, some side B, A and B, sides A and B belong to same cluster. if there is a path of occupied sites between A and B. A path is a um, step like this. It, um, okay. It is a set of sites connected by nearest neighbor links and if all these sites which are on the path are occupied, then we say that these two sites belong to the same cluster. This relationship of course, is a equivalence relation. So, there are a lot of sites which belong to the same cluster and there are another set of sites which belong to a different cluster and none of them are talking to each other they are not you know. So, you can break the set of all occupied sites into sites belonging to different clusters, it's fairly obvious uh, notation. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I should just say that um, what, um, this word path 
I should tell. So, the path we defined a set of um, links um, between nearest neighbors. Let me not write it down. Okay. So, this is called the percolation problem. There is a different version of the percolation problem where the it is not the sites which are occupied, but the links which are occupied that is called bond percolation problem and it is defined similarly. Okay. There also you say two sites A and B are connected if there is a set of links which go from A to B. Okay. Now, what is directed percolation? Ah, so, sorry let us um, backtrack still. So, Hammersley had defined this percolation problem because he was um, advising the government about gas masks and so in that um, time you know second world war in time or around there um, people used to um, make masks which were sheets of material, but inside they were carbon particles. You should put lot of carbon particles they absorb bad gases, so it acts as a gas mask. And then people realize that if you put carbon particles, if you put too many of them, then the gas cannot go through. And if you put uh, too few, then it does not work of course, very well, not very efficient. So, you want to put carbon particles, but not so that it gets clogged. It should allow gas to go pass through from one end to the other, right. Porous. Yeah, porous, it should have enough pores, which allow the gas to go through. So, this was modeled in this case by saying and that um, so I am introducing a new concept called fluid flow in porous media. So, here you say that there are links which allow fluid to go through and there are other links which do not allow fluid to go through and all these links are independent of each other and they are present or not they allow or do not allow. So, you make a configuration which is the set of allowed links. So, the ones which do not allow I just erase because you cannot go from here to there. So, if I have only a few erased links then you can go from bottom to top, from left to right and it is fairly well connected. If I allow erase 80 percent of the links, then it seems obvious to most people that you will not be able to go from bottom to top, because things will break up into lots of small clusters and it will not, there will be no macroscopic connection. Okay. So, that was the fluid flow in porous media. And then people use this theory for porous rocks in which water goes down under gravity. So, they said that um, for um, water flowing down gravity, this is my medium and there are all these bonds, some bonds are present, some bonds are not present, but water can only flow down, it cannot flow up. So, the paths which define the flow of water are all directed paths they only go downward. So, if I want to say that if I put fluid at A, it will reach B, you look for a possible path which the fluid could take to go from A to B, but the path has to be directed path, it should only go down, it should not go up. So, the other problem was called percolation, which was a path from A to B, this was called directed percolation, because it is directed path from A to B. Okay, very good. Um, so, we are almost there, 15 minutes. So, I make a big lattice. Um, maybe I should have. I actually thought about whether I should um, make some PowerPoint presentation or not, and I decided that it is good to draw pictures on the board with chalk, it slows me down. 
no, because you can make very nice slick pictures on the computer with ease, but maybe it does not really lead to better um, understanding. Okay. So, anyway, so this is all the links, then I remove some links. did not do a great job, but anyway I erase some links. Now, let us see if I put fluid on top will it reach the bottom? Is there a spanning cluster from top to bottom that was the question we asked earlier. And I suppose just by visual inspection, yes, it reaches, yes it reaches in this case. Then I mm, remove a few more bonds and now it does not reach. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, there is thing now I see there is no there is a path, sorry, one more bond has to be deleted. Now it does not connect. Okay. So now I just want to think of the same graph. I will draw the infected sites as uh, with like this. Suppose these sites were the ones where I um, put in water. So, the water is going down. So, it will wet this site and it will wet this site and it will wet this site and this site and this site and this site. And that is all. This cannot wet anything else stopped. Oh, sorry, this one. Okay. So, this is the wetted cluster corresponding to this site. Now, I want to look at the same process. So, this side will also wet some stuff. Maybe I should erase more bonds that will make my life easier. Okay. So, this one does not wet anything below, this one wets this one and, and nothing else below, and this one wets this one and this one and this one and this one and nothing else, right. Okay. So, mm, that is how the infection spreads, it does not go any further. So, now I would like to think of the same process as an infection process in a one dimensional orchard. So, I will say this direction is called time and these are the places where the trees can be, these are, you know these are the infected trees and these are healthy trees. At next time step, a tree here, which was here also, um, well, um, I should draw odd and even sub lattice um, both, um, then life is a little bit easier. Okay, so, we will take the model that at each time step an infected tree fully recovers, but it can infect the neighbors. Okay. So, this tree at the next time step it is going to be recovered, so I do not draw it, but it can infect these two neighbors which it has infected and these can infect these two, this can infect this one, but this cannot infect these because the infection did not go through. Okay. So, at any time you will have some set of infected sites and um, uninfected sites and uh, in time they evolve and the rules for evolution are local rules. Like if there is a site here, it has these two upward neighbors, if both of them are not infected then this site cannot be infected. If only one site is infected, then it can transmit infection with probability p. If both sites are infected, then it can transmit infection with some rate which uh, may be equal to p, may be equal to a different value p prime. You know if you have twice as many people in the um, house which are infected, then you are more likely to catch infection. Okay. So, so I would like to think of this process which is the same as the directed percolation process 
as an infection process growing in time. All I have done is that the y axis instead of being called space and under gravity, I am calling it time. And the idea is that just like the water cannot travel backwards, I am sorry downward, it can travel downward, but cannot travel upward, you cannot travel backward in time and so both of them are directed paths. So, one can think of all these infection processes as directed percolation on a spatial graph, where all the time direction is the preferred direction. Okay, so, that is the definition of um, directed percolation and now I have 10 minutes. Mm. So, for the infection models, people have studied a lot and there are many variations because this is very rather stupid looking model, but actually it turns out that if you can understand this simple minded model, then you can understand several other models which are a bit more complicated. The qualitative behavior is not changed by the simplifications that are introduced, but people have studied models with um, uh, you know immunity. Like sometimes it happens that you, if you catch an infection once, then you develop immunity, you won't catch it again. So you can have a model in which people evolve in time, but once they have caught infection once, they won't catch it again. Then there are models in which the infecting agents move around space. You know, they travel in planes, go to some other countries, give infection there, then go to somewhere else, and so on. So. Uh, models in which the infecting agents are not trees which are static, but animals which can move around and they transmit infection by moving around. The static people can only give infection to local neighbors, which is of course true even in the other case, but then now this guy can move here and then can infect that person. Okay. Um, immunity, partial immunity and all kinds of stuff. Mm, diffusing agents, mm, all these kinds of infection models have been studied. The general result is that if the infection rate is much lower than the recovery rate, then what happens is that if you start with a in population of some infected people, they recover with some rate, they infect a few people, but many more recover and few are infected and in time the infection dies and then it remains dead. Okay, so, let us write that down. Infection model uh, in the basic infection model, uh, for infection rate over recovery rate less than E all infection dies. The basic infection model is what we described there, which is sort of just some uh, this directed uh, fluid porous flow model, where if you have a site, then the fluid um, some bond here is present or absent and if the bond is present, then it can flow down. So, it can infect with probability p. If there are two bonds present, it infects with the probability 2 p q plus p squared. At least one of the bonds should be present. Okay. And uh, so, if the on the other hand, if the infection rate is high, you get into a state where there is a persistent infection. People get keep recovering, but in the population, there is always a finite infection. Okay. So, that is called for uh, infection over recovery greater than A uh, 
there is a finite fraction of population that remains that remains infected even at large times okay so this very simple model the infection model directed percolation model has this very interesting transition where you vary the parameter called the infection rate you start with some set of individuals which are infected some others are healthy independent of the initial state if you evolve in time eventually for small enough lambda you will go into a state where nobody is infected once you reach that state you cannot get out of it because infection can only duplicate itself by you know infecting neighbors it cannot generate right so that is called an absorbing state once you get there you cannot get out on the other hand if lambda is big enough even though there is an absorbing state you will never reach there you won't get there this is mine mm, let it no it is not mine just one second okay so so that is called the state in which there is a finite infection is called the active state and where there is no infection is called the dead state there is nothing happening and this is a transition between active and absorbing state this i would expect it depend on the dimensionality of the lattice yes everything depends on the dimensionality of the lattice so the details of the phenomena like with what power does the infection occur and those kinds of stuff they depend on the details of the lattice but the phenomena that i described so far does not depend on those details i didn't mention any exponents here yet and um, so then people define the rate at which this probability of infinite cluster grows or some such thing those details do depend on the dimension and on the whether there is immunity or not immunity or there is partial immunity or some such thing okay so those we will not discuss now let me just stop here and ask for some questions if you have any uh yeah so there are okay so now i take a very sort of from um coarse grain view of the world so i say that there is space for um, it can be two dimensional space and in some region there is some infection and other region there is none or maybe there is more than one infected region okay and now after some time what happens well what can happen is that this in i just take a picture after some time and i'll find that this infection region may have moved or may have become bigger or both right or it may disappear also you know, some people will recover so if i look at the infection process uh, coarse grain infection process with time the process has these features it has Uh, diffusion because it moves but it which way it will move i don't know so it you can say it moves left or right with equal probability because there is no preferred direction uh and there is a growth because some people can be, you know the infection can grow in time and there is death and there are rates for all these things there is a rate for diffusion there is a rate for growth there is a rate for death if the growth rate is bigger than the death rate then the process will be active in the active state otherwise it will be in the inactive state and we are not getting into the technical details of what happens in between sorry what happens to 
the precise exponents and stuff. So, main difference is that uh, this is not particle number conserving. Yeah, so right now we did not define the particle number, so yeah, yeah. They, they are not conserving. Uh -huh. The number of infected individuals is not constant in time. Yes. So, everything is fairly straightforward and clear. So, let me quickly summarize whatever I did today. We said there are fractal forms in nature, then we said that we want to explain how these occur and we said that you since these occur in a very robust form, there must be some kind of self organization which makes it happen. So, that is called self organized criticality and a simple model of self organized criticality was sand piles and then we sort of said let us forget about sand piles for a minute and think about infection processes and in infection processes you have this uh, diffusion growth and death and they can also be thought as percolation processes which are well defined um, on a lattice and you can define configurations you can study in, in probabilities. What is? The diffusion because the infection when I watch pictures the infection diffuses. I do not know what is happening inside. Maybe the agents were moving or maybe what happens is that the infection here got this guy infected and then this guy recovered. All I see is that the infection has moved to a different place. So, that is diffusion of infection for me and I do not care how it occurred inside. Absorbing state is? Absorbing state is a state in which if you go then you cannot come out, it absorbs and then you cannot come out. So, so the state here in which everybody is recovered is an absorbing state because then the infection cannot restart. Okay. And a typical question for all these infection models is that if you give me some initial state will it re recover eventually or will, every, will it go on forever? Will the infection go on forever or will the infection die? That is the first question I would like to ask. And yeah. Ha, very good. Um, so, that is getting slightly difficult, but let us see. So, actually that theorem I wrote down, yeah, uh, I can do that, yeah.